Let's talk about reps. All right, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for bearing with us. We, we are having some technical difficulties, uh, but uh, I think we're ready to go here. So um, thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is John Clements. I'm the technical lead for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers under operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. Uh, HGIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the Homeland Defense and Homeland Security communities. As such, our organization supports those working in Homeland Defense and Security domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD homeland defense and security research. Welcome. Please enter your PIN and press pound when finished. Before we begin, I'll note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the HDIAC webinar announcement. You can go to hdiac.org slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it, at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to, to view webinar PDF, click here, uh, and you can download it from there. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but you can chat with the presenter and moderators using the chat box to the left. However, if you would like to pose a question in the Q&A session at the end, uh, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. It is the icon that looks like a chat bubble with a question mark next to the emoji. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those of you on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Uh, one problem we're having is the presenter apparently cannot hear me, so I'm using some text clues to her to uh, to communicate, to let her know when she can start presenting, when she can stop, so please bear with us. And the Q&A, we may have to do a little differently, um, but we're trying to work through that as, as the presentation's going. Um, if you have technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. Uh, the full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back on the HDI website. Uh, once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, uh, Ms. Frances Vizi from uh, Answer, who also works on the HDI Act team. Uh, she will be today's web presenter, webinar presenter. Uh, presenting on a systems thinking perspective on Vietnam's response to COVID-19. So I have to send her a message to let her know she can start talking and then she can go. Okay, I'm on. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everyone for um, bearing with us on the technical difficulties. And uh, thank you to HDIAC for um, having me here today. Um, my name is Frances Vesey. I've worked for ANSWER for nearly 20 years now. ANSWER is a not-for-profit public interest research organization, um, and we specialize in analysis and management of complex problems for a range of government and international clients. Um, my educational background is in um, microbiology and emerging infectious diseases. And my work often fuses that background with strategic management and emergency response disciplines. Over the past several years, I've worked with the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC as they're commonly known, and its international part partners as well as part of the global health security agenda. Uh, we've conducted a variety of health emergency focus exercises, trainings, and research projects. So today, I'm going to combine this with some of the systems thinking work that I've also done through ANSWER. So we can all think through the different aspects that contribute to successful public health interventions in the COVID era. Um, and we will have a Q&A ses session at the end. Um, I believe that, that John talked you through the um, protocol for that. 
So today we will investigate why some countries had more effective response to COVID-19 in the first year of the pandemic, using a case study of Vietnam to understand key concepts for successful public health emergency response. Of course, every country has a different story to tell about COVID-19. Um, China was where COVID-19 emerged, uh, threatening 1.4 billion vulnerable people. And to make matters worse, the Spring Festival of 2020 seeded virus throughout the country as people traveled far and wide for that holiday. But uh, following that, they did bring the virus under control pretty quickly. They weathered the Delta surge, and they're still maintaining a COVID zero strategy in the face of Omicron, which is kind of a heavy, um, heavy burden. Now, we also have the United States, United States, which successfully contained SARS in 2003, uh, we maintain robust preparedness and emergency programs. We have significant biomedical resources, including what many consider to be the premier public health agency in the world. Given all this, we seemed like we would be well positioned to weather this pandemic. But instead, the United States has been one of the hardest hit countries with around 60 million confirmed cases at this point. And that's nearly 20 percent of the population and still climbing um, even with some of the earliest access to an effective vaccine. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure you all remember the world watched in horror as COVID brought Italy to its knees early on in the pandemic. And their aging population was at very high risk if the disease surged again. Um, but their response was able to keep cases fairly low until the winter that followed. Then we have Vietnam. Because of its lower middle income status, the healthcare resources of Vietnam are fairly limited, um, besides which they have a large population with many super compact cities and a long land border with China. And this is why Vietnam has been considered highly vulnerable to all outbreaks, not just COVID-19. But Vietnam did quite well over the first year and a half. They recorded no or very few deaths the first year, they maintained very low case counts until the more transmissible variants overcame their response strategies um, well into 2021. Um, their initial success isn't explained, though, by total population numbers. The U.S. population is a little over three times Vietnam's population, and yet we had over 10,000 times as many cases during the first year of COVID. So what does explain the difference between the high performing countries and the ones that struggled more? When people try to answer this question, they make charts that look kind of like this, which was shared with me by the CDC country office in Vietnam. They look at these kind of surface level events and try to connect them to the trends that follow. So, I mean, yes, you can see can they canceled flats, flights to China. They had school closures. There's quarantine of travelers from certain areas, then moving to all travelers. Um, there are decisions on social distancing and more. So these are the types of milestones that we can easily see and measure. And in fact, we can often model what might have happened if closures or different measures were implemented earlier or later. But that's not actually what makes for a successful response. There are so many decisions to be made at any given moment that the impact of most of these individual decisions over time is actually quite low. But overall decision making, how you do it, what are the underlying structures that inform decisions, who are the people who decide, those are the dynamics that allow a government to make not just one good decision, but a series of good decisions that results in an overall effective response. Even more importantly, we have to acknowledge that epidemics are driven not by political decisions, but by actual human behavior. And human behavior is a lot more complex than a timeline of cases and public health decrees can convey. This way of looking at things is called systems thinking. Systems thinking is a discipline and a way of approaching questions like this one that views issues and problems as part of a greater whole. It tries to understand how different actors, factors, and processes interact to drive systemic outcomes. It offers approaches for managing complexity, 
helping us to see the underlying and often invisible structures that come together to create the outcomes that we actually observe. Over the course of this presentation, I will try to address the question of how and why Vietnam was able to contain COVID successfully during the first year of the pandemic by looking not just at the outcomes we've seen in Vietnam, but also the underlying structures, systems, and mindsets that made them possible. Before we get started, I, I do wanna mention the systems thinking principle that there are no silver bullets in complex systems. That means optimizing the system for one goal may degrade performance in another area. So please keep in mind throughout this discussion, we are using a public health lens. Um, and when we discuss the key enablers of Vietnam's public health success, there are certainly going to be trade-offs in other areas like civil rights, economics, and others. But by understanding the kinds of things that enabled their success, we can more clearly see our corresponding underlying structures and whether they enable or impede effective public health response, as well as where we can actually make improvements. So first, what do I mean when I say underlying structures? I mean that what we see is the tip of the iceberg. From the surface, we only see a small bit of floating ice. What we don't see is the great mass of ice underneath the surface, which is required to push the tip up over the waterline and into view. Into view. With an iceberg, what's below the surface gives the, gives the visible part its shape and structure. And when we look at ongoing events, it's the same thing. And the systems thinking world we call this the iceberg model. The visible part, the events and the outcomes are all shaped by elements lying under the surface. The outcomes we see and measure, like the rate of spread, the case counts, the deaths, they occur because of trends and patterns of behavior like mask wearing, hand hygiene, mobility, and compliance with public health measures. These patterns are produced in turn by system structures or how parts of a system are organized. Who has power? Who makes decisions? How information flows? Even how we're physically distributed. So high or low population density, how many family members live together in households, those types of things. So the public health system, the political environment, geography, family structures and customs, they're all in play. A system structure explains why that system behaves the way it does, because it creates incentives, deterrence, and motivators that drive people's behaviors and in turn shape the systemic outcomes or events we see. But it actually goes down even further because these structures didn't come from nowhere. They're influenced by and they reflect our mental models our values and belief systems that create the society around us. For example, whether we have good science literacy or a good idea of germ theory, our levels of respect for authority, ideas about the relative importance of community versus the individual, and more. When it comes to public health, people often focus on behaviors with very little understanding of why people behave how they do. They think if they just tell people to do things differently, they will. But things are rarely that simple. When people are overweight or obese and diagnosed with a heart condition, they are often told to diet, exercise, and lose weight. Some will follow the new regime, but let's be honest, most won't, because our behavior is very complex. Similarly, when we look at case studies of emergency responses, we tend to focus on what decisions were made when, without much thought of how the unique country context, its structures and mental models shaped and conditioned those decisions. My hope with this lecture is to give you some sense, not only of how Vietnam has responded successfully, but also the underlying structures and mental models that laid the groundwork for the results we've seen so far because those are the areas where we have the best ability to make positive change wherever our interests lie.
So without further ado, an iceberg model investigation of Vietnam's COVID-19 response, starting with the visible events and outcomes. Even though their first case in Vietnam was earlier than most countries, after a year, they had seen only 1,500 total cases, and they had among the lowest case and death rates by population in the world at that time. Their relatively robust testing numbers also suggested that this was not an undercount due to low capacity, as we see in many countries without adequate health systems or testing. And they even maintained the success fairly well into the second year. Prior to the Delta surge in the summer of 2021, only one in three million had died of COVID, and cases were still under 3,000 total. In comparison, by that same time, the U.S. had seen 33 million cases, or 10% of its population, and over 100,000 deaths. How did they do it? So, recognizing their country's vulnerability, the Vietnamese government sought to prevent importation of the virus by conducting strict health screening at points of entry in mid-January. Flights to China were initially canceled, then to other hotspots. Similarly, initially, travelers from affected regions were required to quarantine, but by mid to late March 2020, all travelers faced mandatory quarantines in centralized facilities. These travel restrictions were accompanied by enhanced surveillance and public health actions to catch cases early and prevent community spread. Vietnam has indicated that they were successful because of government commitment to early response, applying a proactive approach with a spirit that translates to Fighting the epidemic is like fighting against the enemy. But that's only part of the picture. We talked about looking for patterns of behavior. We mentioned mask wearing, mobility, compliance with public health measures. So let's look at the behavior patterns and trends in a couple of different response areas. We know that usually when someone gets sick, they stay home and family members take care of them. Unfortunately, this widespread practice is actually one of the major drivers of many types of infection, not just COVID. So Vietnam developed a treatment strategy to change this pattern of behavior and instead ensure all confirmed cases were treated in healthcare facilities where trained staff could follow more rigorous infection control procedures. To help in this effort, they made all treatment free of charge. They also quarantined and closely monitored suspected cases and close contacts also in healthcare facilities, limiting their ability to spread the disease within the community. They made effective use of treatment resources by applying a triage scheme and transferring severe cases to provincial or national hospitals. And the government also prepared for large scale treatment needs by activating military and field hospitals. Vietnam has also done very aggressive surveillance and detection, including contact tracing, not just of the first line of co close contacts, but those people's contacts, and then those people's as well. That's three tiers of contact tracing, regardless of whether they show symptoms. Now this commitment means that even with few cases, a very large number of people can be quarantined, half a million or more during flare-ups. To facilitate this monitoring and reduce community spread, Vietnam housed all suspect cases, first-tier contacts, international entries, and discharged patients in centralized quarantine facilities. Second and third-tier contacts were asked to quarantine at home and report any symptoms. And Vietnam supported this strategy with a prioritized testing protocol where they used the more accurate PCR tests for suspect cases, close contacts, and those in government facilities, while the quicker but less accurate antigen tests were conducted on populations in high-risk areas. Realizing they could still miss cases even with this fairly robust approach, Vietnam took 
additional steps to contain spread within communities. They use targeted isolation and lockdown for 28 days in the whole community if there was a cluster of cases or spot isolation like the floor of a building or a similar small area if there was just a single confirmed case. They also gradually adopted other community containment measures like school closures, cancellation of public events, mandatory masking, enhanced hygiene, and of course, more extensive lockdowns as needed. In order to support this approach, they had a very, very robust communication strategy. They shared information early and maintained a high level of transparency. They used all potential channels, TV, radio, mobile phones, websites, social networks, hotlines, even loudspeakers, to share information that the public needed. Symptoms, things, things they can do to protect themselves, testing sites, um, and other official information sources. And one thing that we've learned in risk communication is that it isn't just the message that's important. The messenger also matters a great deal. So there needs to be trusted messengers who are credible in a variety of communities. Vietnam used this principle to engage grassroots authorities and social organizations to make sure that they reach every household and individual. Now, they did face both misinformation and disinformation like elsewhere, but they stated that they were very determined not to let this disrupt the response. They monitored for disinformation and they very, very strongly penalized anyone who provided incorrect information, either intentionally by, or by accident. The behavior trends and patterns we just discussed don't happen in a vacuum. In a system, parts fit together in a certain way based on their relationships and interactions. These relationships in aggregate make up the underlying structure of that system. I mentioned at the beginning that a system structure explains why the system behaves the way it does because it creates incentives, deterrents, and motivators that drive behavior. Many of the actions taken in Vietnam are simply not feasible in other countries. But if we want to replicate at least some elements of their success, it's important to understand how the underlying structures throughout Vietnam enabled people to change their behaviors enough to contain the spread of disease. To understand how this works, we'll look at how four key structures enabled effective response in Vietnam. As we go through this section, I want you to keep in mind just a few things. First, the characteristics and features of the structures we discuss here help enable the outcomes we see, but they're not determinative. That is, just because a government is structured a certain way, that doesn't mean they will definitely have a successful response. How the structures interact with each other is also very important. And this is why even similar countries can have very different experiences, though trends can certainly emerge. Furthermore, we will discuss how these structures helped facilitate certain response attributes. It doesn't mean that only that type of structure is helpful or necessary. You can get to positive results with different structures, but it is helpful to see how other countries' structures help or hinder them so we can more clearly see the strengths and limitations of our own system structures. The first underlying structure is, we'll discuss is the political system. So why does the political system matter? My research on the first SARS epidemic in 2003 looked at which country level factors helped or hindered response. The findings highlighted a few keys to success. First, coordination was by far the biggest problem across countries. Therefore, countries with political systems that made coordination easy did particularly well. For example, Singapore, which is a city-state, has few levels of government, really just that one. So it's quite easy for leadership to speak with one voice and to institute clear guidance. Most countries, though, are not city-states, so they can't really solve the problem this way. However, 
Research suggests that a strong centralized government system is helpful for conducting a well-coordinated health emergency response. A single party political system also helps with presenting a unified message and the resulting um, effective risk communication helps drive behavior changes and compliance with public health guidelines. The single party system also has implications for what Vietnam considered to be their biggest strength, a strong government commitment. This can be easier to accomplish without an opposition party that might criticize and undermine the government response for political gain. So the political system is one of the underlying structures that condition what is possible in response. Another element of effective health emergency response is whether political leadership has a strong understanding of public health law. Here, Vietnam's one-party political system also comes into play. While elections are held every five years, in practice, the Communist Party has a firm grip on the nation's government, so you don't see the high level of political turnover you might see in other systems. And this can be very helpful in any disaster response because responses rely so heavily on political leadership. Often in systems with higher turnover, disaster response professionals have to teach the incoming leaders over and over again, every time there's a new leader, about how the response systems work, about the relevant legal frameworks, etc., in order to get the leaders to just even follow the laws and systems that are in place. And this is important because legal frameworks and the legal system overall can also support or hinder effective health emergency response. If you want those aggressive public health measures, then you need clear authority to mandate isolation and quarantine. And very importantly, you also need voluntary compliance with public health measures. While some enforcement is generally needed, you really can't enforce your way to an effective response in a country of 100 million people. You need people to understand and believe that the government has the power to make these mandates and follow them, either out of a community spirit or at least to just avoid punishment. Vietnam's legal frameworks provide this structure. Their constitution, based on communist ideology, emphasizes that citizens' rights are inseparable from citizens' responsibilities and duties, and specifically allows restrictions on human rights and citizens' rights for the purpose of community well being. In part due to these factors, Vietnam is able to operate a centralized quarantine operation which removes suspect cases from the community before they can spread the disease and also eases the burden of enforcement, which involves tracking and monitoring hundreds of thousands of people, then finding and punishing those who don't comply, which often doesn't happen until after they've already infected others. Of course, this response option would not be available in countries with stronger individual rights and freedoms. You may have noticed that the two structures we've covered so far are distinct from the public health and healthcare systems that are more directly involved in response, but hopefully you can see how important they are nonetheless. Now let's look more closely at how the way Vietnam's public health and healthcare system is organized facilitates their response. First, how do we get a well-coordinated response? Well, we know how to not get one, and that is to put a lot of different people in charge with no real accountability to each other. For example, in the United States, we have a federal system of government, which means states operate relatively autonomously, with the governor of each state in charge of the response within their borders. Our federal government, including the president, does not oversee or have command authority over the governors, and the CDC only provides guidance to states. Similarly, within states, local municipalities like counties and cities often have their own authorities and health departments that are separate from the state, and they maintain their own systems for recording and tracking data, among other things. 
Conversely, Vietnam has a centrally managed, socialized healthcare system. What does that mean? It means the national government through the Ministry of Health has command authority over every level from regional and provincial down to district and commune. Of course, there will always be communication problems among different levels of government, but at least in this public health system, it is quite clear who is in charge, and that helps with coordination. Now you can debate the relative merits of centralized and decentralized systems of government, but in this case, it was clear in SARS, and it seems to also be the case in COVID-19, that centralized management can make coordination of a public health emergency response much easier. For example, centralized management means they can adopt an overarching treatment strategy, prioritize cases consistently, and shift resources to ensure that their limited capabilities are used to their best effect. While there are both public and private hospitals in Vietnam, the central management makes coordination much easier. You can contrast this with the United States, where the healthcare sector is mostly privatized. Different hospitals and hospital systems are di use different procedures and electronic records and operate mostly autonomously from each other. It's difficult to enact a system that allows for a coordinated strategy that uses resources most effectively in this type of setting. Similarly, Vietnam's socialized healthcare system allows them to guarantee universal access to free treatment in a safer facility than in their homes, where they can spread the infection to family members. This is not possible in many countries, including the US, um, but in Vietnam, capacity is the main limitation, not cost concerns. I would suggest also that Vietnam's economy might have enabled their response as well. Their mixed economy combines elements of socialism and a planned economy with some free market principles. Both public and private sectors are accustomed to a higher level of regulation and control over their ability to do business, leading to greater private sector engagement in the response. They may also be more likely to cooperate with government initiatives for supporting affected individuals, for example, by providing free goods to the community which they did through rice ATMs and free of charge stores. The single party political structure we mentioned previously interacts with this area as well. In highly partisan countries, the private sector might shy away from supporting government initiatives that can be politicized for fear of alienating some percentage of their clientele. And this spirit of cooperation also derives from the culture of collectivism that's apparent in Vietnamese laws, economy, and daily life. The willingness to put community above the individual and above a company's profits also bodes well for overall compliance with public health measures because culture plays a really important role in managing outbreaks. A cooperative or collectivist culture more comfortable with reducing individual rights for a greater community benefit is actually very helpful for disease management. Again, we can debate the merits of different economic systems, but it's really not hard to see how a country with this type of history and culture might have an easier time making the personal sacrifices that can come along with aggressive public health measures. And you'll, you'll also see manifestations of this culture pop up in society structures, including robust social support systems, socialized medicine, laws and legal systems, as well in the mindsets and attitudes of the population, because in fact, it is not just a structure, but a mental model that fundamentally shapes society, as we will see in the final section. We've seen some of the structures that helped Vietnam succeed when others have not. For example, the well-developed public health system, strong centralized government, and the legal authorities needed to conduct a very proactive containment strategy. Now let's look at the mental models that enabled those structures to work effectively. To understand how mental models affect behavior, we must first understand what is a mental model. 
It is an explanation of someone's thought process about how something works in the real world. It's a simplified version of reality that reflects a person's intuitive perception about his or her own acts and their consequences. The world is very complex. And frankly, if we had to experience everything anew, we'd be very quickly overwhelmed. So we really rely on these simple mental models to reflect our values and the way we think the world works. Mental models are so deeply ingrained in how we understand things that we don't always even know what our mental models are. As a result, we often assume others share our mental models and perspectives, which can lead to very frustrating misunderstandings when it turns out they don't. Identifying and externalizing these mental models helps us examine why we do what we do. It can be easier to see other people's mental models than our own, though. Often we can't express or even see our own mental models until we are confronted with opposing ones. As a result, our own biases get in the way of our ability to understand people's behavior and change it if necessary. Let's look at one example of how mental models influence behavior before we get to the ones we see in Vietnam. Mask wearing has been a very hotly contested item in some countries and much less so in others. Why would that be? Simply put, the more supporting mental models a person has, the more likely a person is to engage in that behavior. More mental models that discourage the behavior, of course, reduces the likelihood that person will do it. For example, here you can see when faced with the question of whether to wear a mask, a person's related mental models affect their decision. One mental model relates to how seriously you take the threat of infectious disease. Now, this might be tied to experiences, for example, with the SARS epidemic of 2003, or with living in densely populated cities where diseases spread rapidly. These experiences may create a mental model that it is courteous to use a mask to prevent disease spread. Conversely, if you live in less densely populated areas, or your country or region has never experienced serious impacts from infectious diseases, you're likely to feel that infectious diseases are not a big deal, and sharing sniffles and colds is just a fact of life that doesn't really warrant extra precautions like mask wearing. This decision may also be tied into other mental models, including your understanding of the purpose and characteristics of government, which vary across cultures to a great deal and really depend on the kinds of governments you've been exposed to. Based on your concept of the purpose and proper role of government, you may see government as absolutely having the authority to make people wear masks or not. It all depends on our perspectives and experiences. And many times, really behavioral choices come down to what is normalized in that culture. There are mask wearing cultures and non-mask wearing cultures. Obviously, if your mental model is that wearing a mask is completely normal, this is very consistent with the decision to answer yes to this question. <clears throat> when the behavior is not normalized, it will take more communication, convincing, and incentivizing to facilitate that behavior. You can see that mental models about what mask wearing means are tied to culture and experience, and that people can have predispositions either way, but in the end, they definitely can be influenced by deliberate messaging including misinformation and disinformation. And this is why it's important to know which mental models are driving behavior that you want to change. Otherwise, you might craft messages or incentives that would convince you, but that might not be part of the target audience's decision calculus at all. Now let's apply this concept to Vietnam's response. In this section, we'll look at how mental models can support or hinder some of the elements of effective public health emergency response we discussed previously, specifically in the areas of strong government commitment, aggressive public health measures, effective risk communication, and support for affected individuals.
strong government commitment was facilitated by the political structures we reviewed, but is also supported by helpful mental models within Vietnam's leadership that emphasize prevention, that public health emergencies are a threat and should be taken seriously, that prevention is cost effective, that it is actually better to overreact than underreact. And importantly, it isn't necessarily that leadership with these types of mental models don't care about normalcy or mental health or the economy, but that they have this mindset that any harms incurred are worth the cost in terms of lives saved, worse economic harm avoided, or even they might have motivations like maintaining the government's reputation or a party's political power. These, model, these mental models that we saw here were in part shaped due to Vietnam's experiences with SARS, H1N1, and other outbreaks that showed them how quickly a disease can spiral out of control. A country without those experiences might have different mental, model, mental models around prevention. Aggressive public health measures have also been very effective in Vietnam, but they needed to be supported by helpful mental models like home-based care endangers families, that saving lives is worth limits on individuals' freedoms, and that quarantine in state-run facilities work, works better simply than monitoring people in their homes. Finally, they would have to realize that or believe that government is capable of providing essential services for the community. So you see that these again tie back to mental models about the purpose and abilities of government as well. And also accepting that people who don't look sick can nonetheless spread disease. These are absolute preconditions for people to comply with such aggressive measures that greatly limit individuals autonomy. Effective risk communication is also driven by important mental models in leadership and in the public, including considering the public as a key response partner. Understanding that transparency and communication, even when we are delivering bad news, builds trust. That spreading incorrect or false information is a serious threat and warrants severe punishment, and that government has the authority to control what people say. These last few points really hinge not only on ideas about free speech, but also whether you believe that people can figure out for themselves which information is bad or good. Unfortunately, we've seen that this is not always the case as rumors and false information abound, especially during times of extreme stress when people naturally cling to conspiracy theories because they give us a sense of control when the world seems totally out of control. So we really need to address these underlying dynamics when we're planning and executing our, our risk communications. Finally, mental models are needed to ensure the appropriate amount of support for affected individuals, which enables people who to do the right things to fight the pandemic. So first, you really have to understand that people who don't appear sick can still spread disease, which means that people who have been exposed should be kept away from others, even if they don't have symptoms. These two ideas run into practical considerations because people who aren't sick will definitely not stay home if it means their families will starve because of it. So we have to recognize that compliance will be better if people are not worried about putting food on the table. Given all this, we now need a mental model of government that is consistent with believing its proper role is to provide significant support and services for the people. Put together, these mental models enable the government to enact a robust support system that enhances the effectiveness of quarantine isolation, and other health measures as we saw in Vietnam. Now that we've looked at how mental models and structures can influence the patterns of behavior that shape the outcomes we see, 
I'd like to close with a few final thoughts I've gained from my work and studies in the management of disaster response and infectious diseases. First, at the events and outcomes level, early aggressive action is crucial to infectious disease response. This means you need a big response to a tiny problem or else later you'll need an enormous response to what has become quickly a very large problem. The response should always feel like an overreaction or else it's not enough. It does take a leap of faith and perhaps a willingness to look a little foolish to mount the level of response that's needed at the start. You have to be willing to overreact and then be accused of overreacting later and this type of behavior is fostered by a culture of prevention. In my opinion, if the worst thing that happens is that people think you overreacted, then I would consider that a huge success because you've made the disaster look small. Second, at that patterns level, governments cannot stop infectious disease through willpower alone. The public is the key partner in behavior changes that will bring infections under control. Viruses, they just simply don't care who's in charge. They don't care how they impact upcoming elections or if the current leader will be ousted if they keep replicating. What they care about are the day-to-day -day tiny interactions of normal people. While governments coordinate and message and provide resources, it's actually the people's patterns of behavior that drive or end epidemics. Even when we think about diseases with medical countermeasures like vaccines or antibiotics, people still have to get vaccinated to stop measles or polio and now COVID. People have to take a full long course of antibiotics to stop tuberculosis. Uh, ending epidemics depends on small decisions made by everyday people. Will I wear a mask? Should I get tested? Should I stay home and have my family care for me while I'm ill or go into isolation? Will I host a large party or wedding as planned? Messaging, communication, and awareness are all critical, but with these, you have to target the incentive structures and mental models that shape behavior if you want to have success. Third, a system's existing structures can facilitate or limit response. These are complex systems with many factors, sociocultural, political, scientific, logistical, and other considerations all make up a country's response ecosystem. And only some of these factors are within the control of the health emergency response community. We need to acknowledge and understand our existing structures and how they might constrain us when we try to put together an effective policy or program. We have to think about the systems we use to respond holistically and determine what incentives and resulting behaviors they create, how they interact with the broader environment. None of the structures dis discussed today is determinative. They won't make for a successful response alone, but their interactions, along with strong leadership, can make it easier for a country to mount a more effective response. Lastly, at the mental models level, you just simply can't separate disaster response from politics and culture. We in the emergency management community try to put as many systems in place as we can to assure effective response, but I think COVID has shown we can't fully insulate it from the political context or from the decisions that are made by our leadership. Political systems, legal frameworks, and culture influence the options we have available for response to infectious diseases and how effectively we can implement them. So I would ask you to reflect on the ways that our political systems condition what outcomes are achievable, as well as the ways our society's culture and mental models influence people's behaviors and their willingness to change them. By understanding and targeting these root causes, you can design more effective interventions to COVID-19 or really to any challenge you're trying to address. So um, that brings us towards the conclusion. If you're interested in reading more about this topic, I do have some very good news. Uh, this presentation is just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. 
ANSA collaborated with the International Institute for Global Resilience, or EAGER, to bring together six international case studies, including Vietnam, with a focus on the underlying structures we discussed today. In the concluding section of that publication, I try to really discuss some of the fundamental root causes that created themes throughout these case studies. The publication is available on both the websites of ANSWER and EAGER, and we'll have a limited edition print copy. So if you're interested in one of those, please just contact me separately. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found this presentation to be useful and you start noticing how these concepts apply to a myriad of problems and situations in our daily lives and our work. We do have um, at least five minutes uh, for Q&A, though I will be happy to stay past the hour mark if people wish to continue the discussion. Um, I'm going to try to call in so I can hear better, but in the interim, um, John and Daniel, if you wouldn't mind putting some of the questions into the presenter chat so I can read them and respond. Okay, yeah, we will do. I'll get the first one in there. Okay. The first question we have is how were the COVID-19 patients treated in the field hospitals? Were tents used? If so, did the tents have the capability to mitigate the spread of an airborne virus? Um, so I was not on the ground in Vietnam at the time. However, I believe that at least through the first year and year and a half, um, they just used the organic capabilities um, in their own um, hospitals. Um, they were able to do that because they kept the case numbers so low that they really didn't need to take advantage of some of the um, um, assets that they had uh, pre-staged. Now, this, this past summer, um, things got a little bit hairier, um, and I, you might have been able, you might have seen that there were more extensive lockdowns, um, but, but yeah, I, I don't really have insight on the specific IPC protocols within the tents. Um, next question. Let's see. Um, I see another one that says, could they have some immunity to the original coronavirus that started the epidemic, which is present in the local bat populations? The two later waves you showed on your graph roughly coincide with the Delta and Omicron variants, which would be new to their immune system. Um, you know, getting into the very molecular um, characteristics of the coronavirus, I would say that's likely fairly low um, as, you know, as an uh, immune uh, response. I believe that the original alpha variant that emerged was novel to everyone, including um, those who live in China and in Vietnam. So I, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, that doesn't explain um, their underlying success. Let's see what else? Do you think America will finally invest more money to bolster its public health system, which could serve as a force multiplier to combat future military civilian medical surge capacity while supporting the global security health, health security agenda? Um, I certainly hope so. I think that this pandemic has laid bare the importance in, of investing um, in public health. Um, I know that as I was working with um, exercises in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in 2018 and 2019, the CDC country offices were being just absolutely um, demolished. You know, they would go from a staff of 20 to 24 to maybe two. Um, and so that was what was happening right before this pandemic um, came around. So hopefully we'll reverse that trend and we'll invest more not only in our internal public health structures, but also in how we conduct and think about public health around the world. Let's see. Francis, I'm can just you, trying can to you scroll hear? through these, uh, these questions. 
Um, I think that's all about all I can see. If anybody has additional questions, um, please put them in the attendee chat and I'll be happy to respond. All right, everybody, I apologize. I'm gonna, uh, Francis cannot hear me right now. Uh, so I'm trying to get some of the questions over to her. Um, so just bear with me for one second. Okay, and um, so I am not seeing any additional questions. So I want to thank everybody for your um, time and attention. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions. And I hope that this presentation has uh, helped you understand not only how Vietnam successfully responded, but perhaps how we can improve our own response uh, moving forward. Okay, even though you can't hear me, I'll say thank you very much to Francis and uh, thank you everybody for your patience. I'll get Francis the questions that were asked that were not answered. Uh, again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And um, again, you can view this webinar on our YouTube site. It will be posted uh, probably by tomorrow. And uh, thank you very much to everybody who attended.